Praise the Lord. Good evening, everybody. This is Pastor Bill Emmons, and this is CFC Ministries International, or Covenant Faith Center. Good to have you with us. Um, I, for the last 20 minutes or so, I've been, uh, we lost our music um, somehow. I, I don't know how. Um, and I had to get it back. I got back the one, our theme song. I got that back. Uh, I guess I'm going to have to go through and download or upload or whatever the terminology is. <clears throat> the music that we like and have been using. Um, and uh, so we should have that done before Sunday so that uh, we have our regular time of worship. And uh, so I'm just checking my, my checklist here to see that I've got everything done. We got the lights on, we got the mics on, we got the cameras on, got Instagram on, and... Uh, I need to make sure I'm sitting right in the middle so Instagram gets me centered. You know, Instagram has a vertical uh, picture where Facebook, you can get the horizontal and get a better picture. But for some reason, Instagram has a different format. So we have to kind of try to adjust to that. Anyway, we're glad to have you with us tonight. This is our Tuesday Night Live Bible study. And um, I want to encourage you to help us reach more people. We're not doing this just for our own sake, just because we got nothing better to do. We're doing this, number one, because the Lord uh, directed us to do this, and number two, so we can reach people with the good news of the gospel. And uh, I want you to understand something about the, the, the word gospel. 
Uh, it literally means good news. And what is good news? Well, the first and most obvious and most important is forgiveness of sins and restoration to uh, the right standing with God, our Father. Uh, and then we we go beyond, or I hate, it's hard for me to say beyond salvation. Uh, salvation is all inclusive when it comes to the blessing. Uh, it's what God promised us. Uh, well, actually from the fall, from the time Adam fell, God implemented the first covenant sacrifice uh, with Adam and Eve and uh, made some promises that if you don't study it, you won't, you won't really see it. It's not so direct and blunt like um, what God spoke to Abraham or Moses and so forth, <clears throat> but it was there. God had a plan before man was created, before the worlds were created. God had a plan because he knew he was going to make man and he was going to make man with the ability to make his own decisions, make up his own mind. And um, that, that's what makes us different than every other thing in existence. We have been given the ability to make our own mind up, to go whatever direction we want to go. Now, that, that means that uh, we have the, the potential of going for good or going for evil. And Adam and Eve... Um, didn't know the difference and God didn't want them to know the difference. But the, the serpent came in the garden and um, uh, deceived Eve. And then she encouraged her husband and they ate the fruit and they died spiritually. And, and uh, man's uh, been separated from God. It, unless you were a, in covenant with God and you went through the covenant ceremonies, sacrifices, all the things that go with it, keeping the law, um, you know, that, that would give you a temporary covering. But there was always the promise of a complete restoration to the condition of Adam uh, before the fall, that mankind would come to a place where we could be restored to that same condition. And so uh, it took a while, it took uh, 4,000 years, uh, but Jesus came, he paid the price, he redeemed us or bought us back from the devil's control and uh, gave us right standing with God. And uh, that's, that's good news. But then the Bible says when God made promises to Abraham, the biggest promise was the promise of a Messiah that would bring total restoration. But along with that, he made promises. If you, if you keep my word, uh, he said there'll be blessings. Uh, Deuteronomy 28 verses 1 through 14 tell you the uh, it's probably the best list of the blessing of Abraham, and uh, then it, and it says that if you don't keep my word, there's a curse in the world, and you'll be under the curse. God did not curse anybody. That's the nature of the devil. When Adam fell, he he took on the nature of the devil, where before he had the nature of God. But that one act of disobedience separated him from God. Now the only other influence he had was the nature of the devil, because when he died spiritually, he died or was separated from that nature of God as well. So God made promises to Abraham, and the Bible says that when he made those promises, that, uh, that God swore an oath by himself. What that means is he swore on himself and that he would keep his covenant promises to Abraham and to Abraham's bloodline descendants and to Abraham's faith line descendants. In the New Testament, the Bible says that, that uh, we are the true heirs of Abraham if we walk in the faith of Abraham. And Abraham, his faith was, was so simple. It was just, you know, I choose to believe God and whatever God says he'll do. Very simple faith. But we as Christians, we complicate things and, and uh, we tend to give up on God too many times, even though he doesn't give up on us. Now, this is not my message. This is just an uh, introduction. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, God is a covenant-keeping God. And we have multitudes of promises that God has made throughout the Bible. And anything that God has ever promised anybody if we keep his word, not we're not keeping the law. Jesus was able to 
fulfill the law, which and now it's not needed anymore because God said he'll write his law in our hearts. When you're born again, the Holy Spirit begins to minister to you and the law, the word, the, the, the things that God has directed for our lives to be victorious, he begins to write on our hearts. And uh, so we don't need that written law, the Ten Commandments and all that. Not that they're bad, uh, but they were limited. And once you make Jesus Lord and you receive him as your Redeemer, Savior, Messiah, uh, then it's written on your heart. And that's where then he says we, ought to, we need to be led by the Spirit and not by the senses or the flesh. And that's where man struggles. <laughs> all right. The title of tonight's uh, Bible study if you're keeping notes, and I hope you are, um, when, when you come to our services, whether uh, you were to come in person or online, uh, I encourage everybody to do two things. Carry a Bible. You say, well, I've got an iPad or an iPhone or, or you know, what a tablet, and I've got all my Bible translations in there. That's good. But you know what? There's something good about opening your Bible and having a notebook and taking notes. That helps you to get it in you. So I encourage people, open your Bible. Don't just sit and listen. Get out your notebook and start taking notes because you're going to learn something tonight. And it's going to bless you tonight. Amen. I've got a lot of scripture here. Uh, uh, my notes are 99% scripture. <laughs> so uh, whatever the Holy Spirit wants me to say on these verses, I, I'll say it. So we're going to go to... Um, Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to start at verse 6. I'm going to read it from two different translations, just so you get the full uh, insight, or at least more insight than just one translation, and uh, it'll help you. Verse 6 says, talking about Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery, robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient even unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, I, I wanted to read starting with those verses, because as you've, if you've been following our ministry, you know I have uh, you know, shared scripture over and over again, about how Jesus stripped himself of his deity and became human, became one of us. If he was God operating in the earth for the 33 years of his life, then he could not have been tempted. He could not yield. Uh, he got, could not have any pain because he's God. God doesn't have pain. God doesn't have lack or want. Yet Jesus, the Bible says, was tempted in all points like we are. How can you be God in the earth and functioning as God, where you could not have any of these needs, and then turn around and have needs, you're not God, if that's the case. Jesus became human. Now, verse 9 says, Wherefore God also has highly exalted him, and given him a name, which is above every name. We're talking about the name. That's the core emphasis tonight. The power of the name. All right, so a name above every name. Verse 10, so that at the name of Jesus, or in one translation says, as the use, at the use of that name. When you say in the name of Jesus, that gets <laughs> the attention of everything in heaven and everything in the, in the demonic realm. It gets Satan's attention. And we need to understand there's power in the name, and we need to use the name. All right, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth. Now, you need to see there, there's three realms of authority. Talking about the name of Jesus has power in heaven, it has power in the natural realm, and it has power in Satan's realm. Can you get, can you... I mean, that, that's, uh, how, how in the world does the name of Jesus have any power in the devil's realm? Well, the devil has to bow his knee to Jesus. And when you say, in the name of Jesus, sickness or disease be gone, that devil and demons that may be involved with that 
must obey the command given in the name of Jesus. All right. And by the way, those three realms are the, are the three realms that were impacted by Adam's fall. And, you know, it's interesting. Uh, we have three realms we're dealing with. and We have the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. There's three. We have spirit, soul, and body of man. Uh, I think God likes threes. <laughs> All right, verse 11. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Now I want to read that from Philippians chapter 2, uh, again in the Passion Translation, to give you just another facet of uh, this word. In verse 6, talking about Jesus again, he existed in the form of God, yet he gave no thought of seizing equality with God as uh, his supreme prize. Instead, he emptied himself of his outward glory by reducing himself to the form of a lowly servant. He became human. You can't get much clearer than that. He didn't walk in the earth for 33 years as God. He walked in the earth for 33 years as a man, so that what? He can identify with us and we can identify with him. If, if he's just God in the earth, well, of course, he can heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, uh, turn water into wine, uh, you know, <laughs> walk on water. Uh, I mean, we just could go on a long list of things he did in his ministry. But he didn't do it as God. He did it as a human being, a man, functioning under the old covenant. I mean, just think about the power, even in the old covenant, which is what Jesus was functioning in, because there was no new covenant yet. And in the whole process of that time, he didn't fail to keep the law. He didn't fail to stand up to the tax of the devil. He didn't fail to the temptations the devil threw at him. And, uh, you know, what we see from that is if this man who has flesh and has the ability to be weak and to fail, he's just like you and me. If he can do it, that means we have the ability to do it also, but we've got more than what Jesus had at that point. We have him as our Lord and Savior. When we make him our, our Lord and Savior, he dwells within us. The Father comes to dwell within us, and the Holy Spirit ministers to us. We open up a whole new realm of strength and ability. I can do, the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. He couldn't do that. He had to function as a man under the old covenant. We've got the new covenant. The Bible says it's got better promises, better guarantees. And uh, I, I, I know that for a fact. All right. So it goes on and says in verse 8, he humbled himself and became vulnerable. God's not vulnerable, but Jesus became vulnerable because he was born a man, a human being. Um choosing to be revealed as a man and was obedient. He was a perfect example, even in his death, a criminal's death by crucifixion. Because of that obedience, God exalted him and multiplied his greatness. He has now been given the greatest of all names. That's what I want to concentrate on tonight, maybe next week, I'm not sure. We'll see how it goes the greatest of all names. Verse 10 says, the authority of the name of Jesus causes every knee to bow in reverence. Everything and everyone will one day submit to this name in the heavenly realm, in the earthly realm, and the demonic realm. And every tongue will eventually uh, proclaim in every language Jesus Christ is Lord Yahweh, bringing glory and honor to God, his Father. There, there's just a whole lot of meat there in, that, in those verses. <clears throat> the name above all names. Now, the name Jesus, uh, uh, Jehovah, uh, Joshua is another name. Uh, that comes from that same uh, name, Jesus, in, in the Hebrew language. And Jehovah means salvation, 
or God or and God with us. When we have God with us, we have salvation. You don't have salvation yet until you're born again. You don't have God with you yet until you're born again. But when you make Jesus Lord, you become born again. That's when he comes to dwell in you. And that's what it's talking about. Jehovah is our salvation. Jesus is our salvation. That's, that's how we get back right standing with God. That's how we get back forgiveness of sin. That's how we get back the, the uh, condition of Adam before he sinned is through Jesus, our salvation, and he is God with us now. Why? Because he got back his deity after he was raised from the dead. And I've taught on this uh, last, uh, well, the last month or, or two, I've taught on this um, two or three times. And um, after he was raised from the dead, he was caught up into heaven. His sacrifice was received by the Father. The, the ransom was paid to purchase us back from the devil's authority. And he was accepted and was seated at the right hand of the Father. And, and God makes a statement. He says, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I call you my son. Well, you don't have to call somebody your son again if he's already your son. You don't have to uh, use the, that terminology, but that's what God did. And he is a born again human being in heaven. <clears throat> but he got back his deity at the same time. Once he, w once he went to heaven, was uh, accepted, his sacrifice accepted. And then was seated at the right hand of God. The work of salvation was accomplished. Now we have to receive that, but the work's been done. The price has been paid. Amen. All right. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, the Amplified Translation says, but in the last of these days, he has spoken to us in the person, talking about God speaking to us, in the person of a son whom he appointed heir and lawful owner of all things, also by and through whom he created the worlds and the reaches of space and the ages of time. He made, produced, built, operated, and arranged them in order. He is the sole expression of the glory of God, the light being, the outraying or radiance of the divine. And he is the perfect imprint and very image of God's nature, upholding and maintaining and guiding and propelling the universe, turn the page, by his mighty word of power. You need to understand Jesus spoke words of power. When you speak the word of God, you're speaking words of power. That's why Jesus said, if you believe in your heart, uh, I'm sorry, uh, if you believe that the things you say shall come to pass, you shall have whatsoever you say. And he talked about speaking to a mountain. He talked about one time speaking to a fig tree. And we see him using words of power. When we begin to speak in agreement with God's word and we begin to declare God's promises over our situations, then we are speaking words of power. Whenever you speak words contradictory to what God says and God promised, then you're speaking words of, of failure and defeat, death and destruction. And I know, uh, you know, there's a lot of criticism about confession and, you know, people mock and they say, well, you know, those name it and claim it people, blab it and grab it. Well, I don't know about you, but everybody that's born again had to blab it and grab it, name it and claim it. Because <laughs> you had to confess Jesus as your Lord. So you've been confessing the word by saying, I'm a Christian. Every time you say, I'm a Christian, I'm born again, you're confessing the word. So don't criticize people because they step a little bit further down the road in faith than you are. Catch up to them. You know, well, if it's working for them, it'll work for me. The Bible says we're to follow those who, th and don't follow the person per se, but the example of those who through faith and patience are inheriting or receiving a manifestation of the promises. When you see somebody that's walking in the blessings of God, when the symptoms of sickness come on their body, uh, they believe God and they confess they're healed. They declare I'm redeemed from the curse. I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. You're speaking words of power because that's the word of God. 
And, and when we speak the word of God, the devil has to respond to those words. Sickness and disease must respond to those words. Now, if you speak, uh, you know, death and destruction, uh, then your body's going to respond to that. Your symptoms are going to respond to that, and it's going to go from bad to worse. All right. So, Pastor Mary, where was I? <clears throat> His mighty word of power. Okay. When he had, by offering himself, accomplished our cleansing of sins and riddance of guilt, you should not have any guilt when you stand before God. If you've been for, if you've been born again, made Jesus Lord of your life, the Bible says that He removes your sins as far as the east is from the west. There is no more record of those sins. You've been cleansed from all unrighteousness. You've been put back in right standing with God. All right. So there is no not only the, have your sins been cleansed. But there is no more guilt. There's no condemnation coming from God for the things you've done in the past. Now, you can't just go on, keep on doing those things, because then the, the fact is you're still walking in the flesh, and, and walking the flesh is the devil's territory. He'll, he'll bring you to death and destruction. So the Bible says the word to learn how to walk being led by the Spirit. All right. So um, after it finished cleansing and riddance of guilt, he sat down at the right hand of the divine majesty on high. Now listen to this verse. Taking a place and rank by which he himself became as much superior to angels as the glorious name or title which he has inherited is different from and more excellent than theirs. God had a name reserved for Jesus and it was... Uh, you know, like I said, uh, Yeshua, uh, Jehovah, uh, Jesus in English. Uh, you know, if you're from a different language, it'll be, it, it's not a different person. It's just a different pronunciation or interpretation of the name. That name was reserved for Jesus. And that name was given authority, power, and dominion because the man submitted to the will of God and paid the price for our sins. That's how that name got the power and dominion and authority. That's why demons have to bow to that name. Because it's the name of the one person who could pay the price, defeat the work of the enemy, and bring us back to the Father. Amen. All right. So Colossians chapter 2, starting in verse 12. I'm going to read this from the Passion Translation. For we've been buried with him, with Jesus, into his death. Our baptism into death also means we were raised with him when we believed in God's resurrection power. That's Jesus. The power of uh, that raised Jesus from the death or death's realm. This realm of death describes our former state. For we were held. Now he's talking to Christians. He's talking to the Colossian church. So he's explaining things that, that have taken place. All right. He said, but now we've been resurrected out of the realm of death. We Just before that, the statement was, uh, the realm of this realm of death describes our former state before we were born again, for we were held in sin's grasp. What, what's the wages of sin? Death. What's the nature of the devil? Death. Stealing, killing, destroying, Jesus said. All right. But now we've been resurrected out of that death, that realm of death, never to return. For we are forever alive and forgiven of all our sins. He, Jesus, verse 14, canceled out every legal violation we had on our record and the old arrest warrant that stood to indict us. He erased it all, our sins, our stained soul, he deleted it all, and they cannot be retrieved. Everything we once were in Adam has been placed onto his cross and nailed permanently there as a public display of cancellation. Well, what's that talking about? When Adam fell, he, he was him and, and Eve, they were the first sinners. They were the first people to fall under the devil's uh, dominion and authority. 
and uh, it, they died spiritually. They, they were separated from God. That's what spiritual death is. And then, of course, they died in their soulish realm, and eventually they died physically. And that's what God warned them would happen before. He said, in the day that you eat of this fruit, you should surely die. But in the original translation, it mentions two deaths. It talk, it's talking about the death of separation from God. And then since man was a, a created to live eternally, there would be a physical death. In other words, man's life would be cut short because of the sin nature that was in man. All right. But all that's been canceled out. Everything we, we were in Adam's fall has been uh, placed onto the cross of Jesus, nailed permanently as a public display of um, cancellation. Jesus bore our sin. He became, the Bible says, uh, Christ, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse, being made the curse for us. What's that mean? He took our place. He couldn't do that as God. He had to do it as a man. He had to be one of us so we can identify with him and say, bless God, if, if he paid the price and, and he did that as a man and suffered on my behalf, who am I to reject what he's done for me? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, once you understand all that, you'd be foolish to reject. There's some people out there that do. They've decided they're, they, they're, they're going to go to hell. Their, their choice to reject Jesus is a choice of eternity in hell. And that's the nature of the devil. He wants to take as many people as he can with him and torment God's creation for eternity because humans are God's creation and we, are, we bear the image of God. And so the devil wants to take as many of us as he can to hell with him. Well, we don't have to submit to that. We can submit to the Lordship of Jesus. We can submit to the faith of Jesus. We can submit to the forgiveness of Jesus. We could submit to all that he did for us so that we could be once again in the pre-fall condition that Adam and Eve were before they fell, spiritually alive to God, have a God connection, the spirit and nature and life of God dwelling in us. That's what Adam and Eve had, but they lost it all when they disobeyed. But Jesus got it back and gave it to us. Hallelujah. That's, that's good news. All right, let's see. Uh, let's go to Colossians <clears throat> chapter 2. You just read that. Did I just read that? I didn't read the whole thing. Did I? Okay, yeah. It's so good I wanted to read it again. <laughs> let's go to Hebrews chapter 2. Yeah, that, that is a good group of verses there. Boy, I'll tell you, canceling out our sin and uh, the devil's nature from our lives and giving us standing with God, that's tremendous. Mm -hmm. Hebrews chapter 2, I'm going to read from the Amplified Translation, two verses, 14 and 15. Since therefore these his children share in flesh and blood, in the physical nature of human beings, he himself in a similar manner t t uh, partook of the same nature, so that by going through death, that's remember Adam died what spiritually and then physically as well. There was a three-way death, but the, the soulish death went along with the physical death. Uh, well, you could identify with the, the spiritual death too, but that's what man lost because of Adam. Jesus took that on himself and that's what separated from him from God because he was our substitute, right? All right. He, he uh, took on the nature of human beings. He himself, in a similar manner, partook of the same nature that by going through death, he might bring to naught. I love that word, naught. You know what naught is? It means nothing. <laughs> it's less than zero. All right. That he might bring to naught or less than nothing and make of no effect him who had the power of death. That is the devil. Now, you don't have to interpret that. It's black and white. It clearly says that. Jesus took the power away from the devil. That's why when you use the name of Jesus, you're walking in the power that destroyed and defeated the devil. You walk in that power in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. All right. Verse 15, and also that he might deliver and completely set free all those who through the haunting fear of death were held in bondage 
throughout the whole course of their lives. Until you get totally free and walk in your full salvation, the devil still wants to plague you with the fear of death. I, I can't tell you how many over the, my lifetime up to this point, how many people I've met who were born again, spirit-filled, love God, and had a uh, just a horrendous fear of death. Well, as a believer, we should not fear death. The Apostle Paul talks about that, and he says, uh, <laughs> he, he says it, and I'm going to paraphrase it, but the way he says it, he, he said, uh, uh, what have I got to fear? He said, for me, uh, to die is gain. In other words, to because I'm going to be in the presence of God. But to, to live, and he talks about living for a purpose, and it was for their need, so they could grow, they could be taught, they could become spiritually mature, and they could carry on what God started there with the apostles. So he said, for me to die is gain. Well, that doesn't mean we want to die early because we've got a job to do. Every believer has a job to do. Every believer is called to preach the gospel. That doesn't mean you got to become a preacher and go out and stand on the street corner and wave your Bible and yell at people with a megaphone. Uh, it doesn't mean you got to become a pastor, an evangelist, a teacher, uh, uh, an, an apostle, prophet. But every one of us are called to share the good news with the people we come in contact with in this life. And if, if you're born again and spirit-filled and you're not doing that, then you're not doing your job. And I'm not trying to put condemnation on you. I want you to open your eyes and realize we all have that responsibility. Amen. All right, so... Uh, okay, let's go to Matthew 28, Amplified Translation, and I'm going to just read three verses here, make it short tonight. Verse 18, Jesus approached and breaking the silence said to the apostles, all authority, all power of rule in heaven, on earth, and remember we read before where he said the power, authority, and dominion in heaven and earth beneath the earth. Well, that goes along here. On, uh, in heaven and earth beneath the earth has been given unto me. Why? Because he did not sin and he defeated devil, the devil in hell and because hell, uh, hell could not hold him there because he never sinned and death could not hold him because the life of God, uh, that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He'll raise you from the dead. So death can't hold you, even if you die. Your body's going to be resurrected, but you as an individual will never die. The, the physical death is simply laying down your outer coat. Like one man said, you lay down your earth suit, but you don't die. You don't even cease for a moment to exist. You are, when the moment you your heart beats its last beat and you breathe your last breath, you are in the presence of God, or at least, let me say it this way, you are in heaven. And uh, I know every person that's gone through experience like that has experienced different things, some for longer times, some for shorter times. Uh, when I experienced that and my heart stopped and, and I died, um, I was in heaven. I didn't have any sense of anything, of dying or anything else. I just, I was here one moment and I was gone the next. And, uh, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to I'd like to write a book uh, on uh, 10 Minutes in Heaven. I think somebody may already have that title, though. But um, I was there for a little while. I saw in the little time I was there the most beautiful things I've ever seen. Now, I, I share that with you to let you know that physical death is not the end. There is no end because you're a spiritual being living in a fleshly body. Spiritual beings don't die. That's why... Hell was created for the devil and his fallen angels so that there would be a place to corral them and keep them from destroying everything God created. And so when you reject Jesus, then you're following the devil and you got his nature then. And where he goes in eternity is where you go in eternity. God's not mad. God's not being mean to you. That's just the choice you made. All right. So all power of rule in heaven, earth, beneath the earth. Then he, he makes this statement, which if you get a hold of this, you're going to be jumping and shouting. Verse 19 says, go then. Who's he talking to? You, me, every believer, the people that hear this word. 
He said, go then and make disciples of all nations. Disciples, the word di disciple, uh, we get the word discipline from the same word. We become disciplined to the word of God. That doesn't mean you're, you're living a, a you know, a thou shalt not kind of life. It means you follow the leading of the spirit, the Bible declares. All right. So make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you all the days, perpetually, uniformly, on every occasion, to the very close and consummation of the age. Amen. So be it. All right. So what do you say there? He talks about all power, all authority, and dominion has been given unto him. And then he says, now you go. One translation, I believe it's the Passion Translation, says, now you go in my authority. We are Jesus' representatives. Uh, what, what do you call the people that represent our government to other governments? Ambassadors. ambassadors. We are Christ's ambassadors. In fact, it says that in the Bible. We are Christ's ambassadors. We represent him. Do you know an ambassador carries the weight and the power of the nation they represent? Oh, yeah, it's a powerful position. We carry the weight and the power of heaven. Oh, that, that's almighty God. That's Jesus. That's the Holy Ghost. That's all the ministering angels. All power and dominion and authority, the heaven and earth beneath the earth, that has been given unto me. Now you go. What, what did that do? He gave back to us what Adam lost because Adam was given the power, the authority, and the dominion over all of God's creation. Read Psalms chapter 8, starting about verse 3, the next five verses or so. He, Adam was given the power over everything God created because this creation was made for us. God didn't need it. It was made for us. Man, we can't hardly make it to the moon and back. And, and we think we're something else. Well, the day will come when we're going to go beyond the moon because once you step over into eternity and, and Jesus comes and the trumpet sounds and, and the dead are raised and we're caught up to meet Jesus in the air, we've stepped over into eternity because we'll have our glorified bodies. They'll never hurt, never suffer again. We'll never die. We'll never be lacking anything. Well, after the seven-year great tribulation, we're coming back to the earth with Jesus for a thousand years. We're going to rule and reign with him in the earth as kings and priests. In other words, he's going to put us in charge of getting this earth back in shape. And then at the end of that thousand-year reign, there'll be the uh, great white throne judgment. That's when uh, hell will be cast into the lake of fire and the inhabitants of hell, the, uh, starting with uh, Satan and the fallen angels. And then you've got the Antichrist and you've got the beast, whatever that is. Uh, and then all those who rejected Jesus will follow them right into the lake of fire for eternity. I do not want that. <laughs> but when you are born again, you don't have to uh, fear the future. It doesn't matter. If I live, I, then, then I serve God. And if I didn't live, I'd have gain because I'd be in heaven. Well, I'm here to serve God, and I'm going to serve God until Jesus comes. And Pastor Mary is too. We've made up our minds. We're going to continue to serve the Lord. Now, we, we believe that the rapture is not all that far away. Uh, but however long it is, we're, we're planning on staying here and doing our job. Our job is to reach as many people as we can with the gospel message. And so I believe some of you tonight maybe have heard this for the first time as I've ministered this. So if you're not born again, or you don't know whether or not you're born again, here's a simple question. If you were to die now, right now, boom, where would you go? And I can tell you from the testimony of people that have died and were on their way to hell, how horrendous it was. And they were given a chance to come back and let people know and get their lives straightened out instead of that final, uh, you know, this is eternity now. So if you passed away, if you died tonight, where would you go? Would you go to heaven? Now, don't start telling me, well, I'm a good person. I do good and I help charities and I, I help the people living on the streets and, you know, things like that. That doesn't get you to heaven. It's making Jesus, Jehovah, uh, Yeshua, 
our Lord, our Savior, God with us, of making him our Redeemer and receiving him. So he paid the price for us to redeem us. And we accept that and we make him Lord of our lives. Amen. I just saw a thumbs up go up. I don't know who that was, but thank you. I see somebody just came on. All right, so let me let me tell you this. If you're not born again, or you can't answer that prayer and say, yes, I know for a fact if I died tonight, I'd go to heaven. If you can't say that, then I want you to pray this prayer with me. I want to just repeat after me. Pastor Mary's going to do the repeat. I'll say it. She'll repeat it, and you repeat it with her. Dear God in heaven, Dear God in heaven I, make a decision I make a decision this night, this, night, this, day, this day, to make Jesus my Lord. Jesus, my Lord. Jesus, Jesus come into my heart. Come into Forgive me, my sins. Forgive me my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Me from all Be, my Lord. Be my Lord. And Father, Father I, call you my Father I call you my Father now because I've declared, because I've declared Jesus as Lord of my life. Jesus is Lord and I thank you that I can call you my Father. And I, thank you, I, call you and I come into your presence come without any sense of sin, any sense of, sin of, guilt, of guilt, or condemnation. condemnation. And I thank you, Father, for what you've done for me this night in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now that's a simple prayer. And if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, then guess what? You are now born again. I remember years ago, how many minutes do I have left? I'm just about, I'm close, about three minutes. Um, well, I won't tell that story now. I'll, I'll bring it up another night. Anyway, I know you got something out of this and uh, share it with somebody. Uh, one of the things that will help you to remember is you tell somebody what you learned, what you heard. And if you took notes, you got good reference there. And, and that'll help get it inside of you. And if you, if you don't have a home church, you can join us here on Sunday mornings for our Sunday morning service. If you have a home church that teaches and preaches the word, not just religion, not just social things, but the word, the, the good news that will set you free, then get in there and get some learning, some teaching, and uh, come back to us for supplemental teaching. It, it, you know that we're here for the for you, and uh, begin your your growth in Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, I didn't ask you to do this, but if you would like, click the buttons: like, share, follow, subscribe, notify, notification, and comment. Even if you just say, "Hey, I was watching the program tonight," that, that's good. Just leave us a comment. Uh, if you want to support this ministry, I'm going to put uh, a couple of things, uh, well, four things uh, up on the screen. They're going to go around my head. All right. So there's the information on how you can give and support this ministry. If we've been a blessing to you and you, you feel that, uh, you know, we're worth supporting and just pray about it. And if, if God impresses upon your heart, then by all means, just be obedient and do what God tells you to do. And there's the ways you can do it. We love you guys. Thank you for joining with us uh, with this Bible study. We'll be back Thursday afternoon. We don't have a set time for that, but it'll be sometime in the afternoon. And we call it Thursday's Word, and we're going to give you a word of exhortation so you can finish the week strong in the name of Jesus. Amen. Be blessed.